All right, folks. Thank you for tuning in. We are going to uh, have our last Wednesday study until next year. Uh, but I hope you've benefited from from these studies, especially uh, the most recent ones through the Book of James. We've had several sessions on the Book of James. But if you remember, this sort of started as an extension of our study of wisdom. We looked at uh, several Old Testament books and that are called wisdom books, and we studied through those. And then James is that book in the New Testament most like the wisdom books. And so we uh, moved on to James in the New Testament, and and we're sort of finishing that up this evening. Uh, we're going to be in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Um, if you followed along last week, we're sort of sk skipping a section there in in James 5, uh, doing that because we did a lesson on that section back at the beginning of the pandemic, and we recorded it and put it out in video form, so it's out there. Uh, if you're missing that particular paragraph in James, I didn't think I wanted to repeat it um, in, during the same year. So we skipped over that. We're going to this last section, verses 13 through 20, and uh, the theme being our life together. And so we will, uh, we will address that here in our study this evening. But I hope you have uh, a good, are having a good day and have a good couple of days as we bring in the new year and a, a year that we have great hopes for. Uh, Hopefully, it's a, it's a much better year for everybody the world over in 2021. Uh, I hope that this look at James has been uh, rewarding for you. I think it's always uh, a rewarding study, this study of James. And, you know, in one sense, it's, it's sort of hard to preach and teach James because it's um, not easy to outline. Uh, wisdom books aren't, uh, a lot of times they're just a bunch of mini sermons or, or, or one verse that teaches a certain point. Uh, and that's a lot what James is like, but uh, there's a lot of riches there too, a lot of wisdom. And hopefully we've noticed that James is very direct and very to the point in what he says. Uh, he's sort of like some of the preachers that I grew up listening to. Um, you, if you've been a long time consumer of sermons, you may identify with this as well. But I often heard them say, as um, they were right about to bring down the biblical hammer, you know, on the audience, they would say something like, Well, I'm sorry if I step on your toes today. Please understand that I'm aiming for your hearts. And James is like that, uh, he's brief. He's plain and he's to the point and uh, not hard to understand, maybe more difficult to apply than to understand. And so uh, I want to start out uh, in one sense uh, in a bit of a summary, just reminding of us of some important things about James that we've noticed as we've gone along. Um, and... Uh, one thing is that James was a brother to the Lord Jesus. Um, just a little bit of his biography there. He does not play off of that like we might expect. I mean, if you were <laughs> the brother of Jesus, you may well take advantage of that, especially if you want people to pay attention and listen to you, read what you write. James never does that. In fact, he refers to himself, instead of the brother of Jesus, he refers to himself as uh, a slave of Jesus, a servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, but he was that. He was also a prominent leader of the first early church in Jerusalem. Uh, tradition says, not scripture, but tradition, that, that he was stoned to death eventually for refusing to deny his faith in Jesus. To, uh, they asked him to recant, and he refused, and he was stoned to death. That's according to tradition. 
He writes this book, this letter to Jewish Christians, most of whom were very poor, and they were being oppressed, it seems, by the rich in their uh, community, um, likely unbelieving rich neighbors. And, uh, and, and so that's a bit of the setting for those who first heard it. And these, <clears throat> these Christians that James was writing to, um, although they were being persecuted, they were far from perfect themselves. Uh, they struggled with various moral and ethical issues that James addresses. He talks to them about things like anger and evil speech, and he talks to them about the problem of show, showing favoritism and even causing divisions in the church. So they had their problems, and that's why they're receiving a letter from James. Uh, it's a very practical letter. It is what we might call a manual for Christian conduct. And uh, I've heard people call it that. I think that's a good description of James. And he emphasizes in it the idea that what you do matters. What one does matters. Not just what one says or claims to believe. So he promotes the practical side of Christian living. And as we said, I think maybe in the first lesson or two uh, with James, it's, you know, he's, he's always promoting the idea, less talk, more walk. And that's a good theme for the book. And so we're coming to the last verses of James in chapter 5, and we should expect something that fits in with the overall theme. And that's what we find. So in verses 13 through 20 of, of this concluding chapter, he touches on some of the prominent things, again, that characterize our life together as believers in the church. They're very, very practical things. In most cases, they're the kinds of things that, that ought to be happening among us every week. As a church, every every day, we might say, um, as we live as believers in the community of faith, these things ought to be common among us. And uh, you'll 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 notice again a focus on what we do in our life together, not necessarily on what we say or claim to believe. Less talk, more walk. So. Uh, when we ask the question, what's the church about? What kind of things ought to be going on amongst us in the church? James has a great answer in this section. And he lists, I think, five things in these verses that are to be central to what our life together is all about. So let's read through them and just comment on them as, as we go through. Um, James chapter 5 again, beginning at verse 13, going through the end of the ch chapter and the end of the book. James writes, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multi multitude of sins. So we're looking again for five characteristics of our life together in the church, and uh, we'll just sort of briefly comment on each one. Here they are. First, 
and I hope it's clear as you, as you hear that text, uh, the first characteristic is prayer. Uh, it, it's very appropriate that James starts off with prayer. In fact, if you read the commentaries on this passage, most of them will say that prayer is the theme of this entire section, and I, and I know where they're coming from because the word prayer is sprinkled throughout the text that we read. Um, the word is mentioned in every verse from verse 13 through verse 18. So prayer is just a basic fundamental characteristic of our life together. We are to be a people of prayer, um, not just public prayer, uh, but private prayer. Um, not just what we might think of as formal prayer, but also informal. And not just planned, but spontaneous. Prayer is a basic tool of a disciple, and it ought to be uh, a top-flight practice of the church, uh, which is made up of disciples. Um, years ago, I heard about a website that was created to transmit prayers to God. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It was started by a guy all the way back in 1999. His name was Crandall Stone. He was 49 years old, and he set it up, believe it or not, after a long night of drinking and philosophizing with some friends in Vermont. Uh, Stone was an engineer from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Along with some friends, he built a $20,000 radio wave transmitting website, believe it or not. Uh, they believe that God was out there somewhere, in their words, and they consulted with NASA scientists to determine where the Big Bang originated. This gets sort of strange. Uh, Scientists said that the oldest known part of the universe was a star cluster called M13. And so this guy, Stone, Crandall Stone, and his buddies aimed their website antennas to that location in the sky. And uh, Stone was quoted as saying, it appears that most people take our service seriously and that a large number are gratified by the results. They transmitted 50,000 approximately prayers a week from people all around the world toward M13 in the hopes that the God of the universe would hear them. Uh, by January of 2004, now they started this in 99, so about five years, by January 2004, the website address that they were using was up for sale. It didn't last very long. Uh, that, that may illustrate a lot of things, but it certainly shows us that people are hungry to be heard by God. I mean, what they suggested is error-stricken as it may have been, uh, and... and as much of a lack of understanding that it demonstrated, people were interested in having their prayers heard by God. It also reminds us that the prayer is really much simpler than that. It's a simple thing. It doesn't require advanced technology. It doesn't require any money, uh, certainly not great sums of money like, like they invested. God hears prayers for free and in the old-fashioned way. Uh, he hears when we speak. He listens. And when we cry out to him, he hears. You know, if we cry out in suffering, he hears. Look at verse 13 of our text. When we cry out because we're sick, he hears. Look at verse 14 of the text. When we pray because we're sorry for something we did, you know, when, when we're sorry for our sins, he hears. Look at verse 16 of the text. And when we're in need of something, he hears. Verses 17 and 18 of James 5. So prayer is just basic to our life together and a major characteristic. Another thing uh, James mentioned, secondly, is praise. 
We are a people who praise. We, we sing praise. Um, when we think of our life together, one of the things that ought to come soon to our mind is praise. Praise is worship. We are a people who worship God, who praise God. Uh, praise is, uh, if we were to define it, I guess just the recognition that our God is worthy. Um, you know, if, if you if you read <clears throat> the description of the heavenly worship uh, in the book of Revelation, you'll find this word worthy over and over again. In fact, I think uh, that word worship uh, derives in part from that word worthy. Um, it, if we say our life together is characterized by praise, we're simply saying that our God, our Savior, is worthy. Uh, praise is making uh, that uh, audible, we might say. Making that which is laudable, audible, is a good definition of praise. And praise is a big part of our life together. Uh, prayer and praise. But also, third, uh, characteristic of our life together in the church is ministry. We are to minister uh, to one another. Um, a lot of people call me a minister, and I guess that's better than some other things they could call me. But uh, I hope it's true. You know, I hope it's true that I am a minister, but in our life together, really, we're all, we're all ministers. To minister just means to serve. And, um, to make it a title for a position is probably not helpful to us. There is no special class of servants in the church. We all serve. And, and James says that you know, we can serve through prayer. We can pray for one another. Or we, we may minister to the sick, as he discusses in this text. Or we may minister by listening to someone who is struggling. Um, you know, someone confessing something to us. There are multitudes of ways. But the important thing uh, for this study is we're to be characterized in our life together by ministry. We are, we are people who serve and minister. And, of course, this is true because the one we follow and the one whose name we wear was first and foremost a minister. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. That's who Jesus was. He was a servant. Uh, and so the question then is, is that who we are? Uh, it's obvious, or it should be obvious to all that we are ministers, that we are servants. And um, there ought to be a defining characteristic of our life together. So we've got three of them, just two more. And the first one is confession. Confession ought to be a prominent part of our life together. So James writes in verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Prayer, praise, and ministry, uh, those first three that we mentioned, you know, this might come to mind easily when we think of what we do in, in church. We pray, we praise, and hopefully it's obvious that we minister, we serve. Uh, but the last two, maybe not quite as obvious, might be overlooked. Confession. Confessing our sins to one another. Now notice uh, James doesn't specify exactly how that's done. Okay, I think that's important. He doesn't say that it's done in public worship um, after singing Just As I Am or, or singing God is Calling the Prodigal, whatever the invitation song might be. He doesn't say anything like that. It may happen at a time like that, but it may just as likely happen one-on-one -on -one during the week. 
It may happen over the phone or the internet, I guess, or over a cup of coffee. There are a number of ways it may happen when we share our struggles, when we confess our sin to one another, but it ought to be characteristic. And, um, and, and one of the reasons that's so important is that to confess sin implies humility. And Christians are to be humble, like Jesus. Uh, Jesus never had sin to confess, but he was humble. And one of the ways we show humility is to admit to one another that we're not perfect. Uh, confessing implies honesty. It's, it's being real about who we are, that we are sinners in need and, and relying on the grace of God to redeem us. And confession also shows that we're vulnerable, that we depend on one another, and most importantly, that we depend on God. So to, to abandon confession, but here, here's what I think happens sometimes with a thing like com confession. I think a lot of people think we do that one time uh, when we're converted and then uh, it never comes up again. And that is, that's a danger sign. Um, it's not as if once we're converted, we never sin. Uh, we certainly do. And, and we need forgiveness and we need to bear one another's burdens. So, um, it, it, it implies humility and honesty, um, uh, vulnerability and, and really to say, I don't need to confess anything ever is really arrogant and dishonest and self-sufficient. So imagine applying any of those terms to the Lord Jesus Christ, arrogant, dishonest, self-sufficient. We never would do that. So why would we ever promote them amongst ourselves as his followers? A confession ought to be a part of our life together. One of our themes ought to be confession. And it's really in keeping with the words of another New Testament writer, John, uh, 1 John 1. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faith, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So confession. The last one comes in the concluding verses of the book, verses 19 and 20. Again, it says there, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So the final characteristic of our life together from this text is restoration. Um, the idea of restoration. You know, a lot of times in church, we, we talk about evangelism and it's something we should talk about because that's the, the mission we've been given in the church. Those are our walking orders to uh, take the good news to the world. But notice uh, in all this passage, James is not really talking about evangelistic outreach uh, to unbelievers. He's talking instead about what we do in the church amongst one another. Um, what does our life together look like? Well, just to review, prayer, praise, ministry, confession, and restoration. It ought to be obvious among us that we actively seek to restore those who have wandered away from God and his people. In other words, that we try our best uh, to restore people. It just ought to be the case amongst us that when someone is missing, they're missed. In fact, that uh, we see signs and warning signs before they're missing. Um, it sounds like a, a simple concept, but it's easier, it's, it's one of those things that's easier to talk about than it is to do. Um, to miss the missing and then to do something about it, to try and restore them. That's part of our life together. It shows that we're concerned for one another and that we're a family. Each of these points 
from James 5, uh, of course, it deserves its own study. And, and much more than just we gave it tonight, a couple of comments. But I thought it was helpful maybe just to outline them to, to help us uh, keep them in mind as we think about uh, what characterizes our life together in the church. These are things that, that just ought to define us. Prayer, praise, ministry, confession, and restoration. And it's our hope that they do. And I'm sure as we look at them, we all see areas for strengthening and, and improvement, both individually and as a body. So great practical stuff from James, as, as we've seen in every text we've looked at uh, throughout this wonderful book. Well, the next time we get together in this venue uh, won't be until next year. So, sounds like a long time, doesn't it? But uh, we will get together uh, and, and be involved in a different kind of study. We're looking forward to the day when we can physically get together again on a Wednesday night or whenever it may be and study the word and encourage one another, pray and praise together. Uh, hopefully that will come sooner rather than later because I know we all miss it. But God's blessings on you uh, this evening and as you uh, celebrate the new year here in the next day or so and we, we pray you're well. We know there's a lot of people struggling right now. Let's pray together for a moment as we close. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your care, for your watching over our lives, for the rich blessings that you shower upon us. Uh, Father, we, we have had a struggle this year with many things, and we're looking forward to the future with hope. And we continue to pray with those who are ill, uh, that you'll bless them with recovery and that you'll protect those who are healthy now, help them to stay healthy. Uh, we know most important is spiritual health. Thank you for a few minutes to feast on your word. May it build us up and show us the way to walk as we follow your son. And we come to you tonight in his name. Amen.